Small note before we begin this fanfic. Someone Better is the first part of the series, Little Cabbage. The second part, Someone Better, is unfortunately, at the moment, uncompleted. Last time it was updated was October 7th, 2022. Someone Better by I under slash am under slash Ellie. Summary. Shota Aizawa spent his entire life with people leaving him. The only constant he knew were his gymnastics and self-defense classes, his boyfriend, and his best friend. He spent most of his life being lonely. And then he got Izuku. Or the story of a little boy going to live with an uncle who has absolutely no idea what he's doing. Episode 1, Chapter 1 Shota knew from a young age that he wanted to be a hero. From a young age, he had always looked up to the big named heroes of the world. Old heroes, like Gran Torino, and heroes that were only just making their way into the world, like All Might. When he'd been younger and needed an excuse to get out of the house, he and his older sister, Inko, would go looking for villain fights. When they found one, which was rather easy, but with it being such a big city, they would hide on the nearest roof and wait for heroes to come. Shota would find himself trying to copy the hero's moves, throwing out a fury of punches and clumsy kicks, doing little backflips and cartwheels on the roof, just to get his blood pumping and to see his older sister smile for once. They started this practice when Shota was four years old and finally old enough to go outside with only his sister to watch him. His sister was much older. She had been 11 when he had been born, and he couldn't quite remember a time when he'd seen the girl truly smile. That was probably the main reason why the days on the rooftops were so important to him. His sister must have seen the talent in his flips and cartwheels, because she started saving all the money she could. When he was five years old, Inko got their mother, gaunt and tired, as she always was, to sign Shota up for gymnastics. Inko took on an after-school job to keep him in the program. When he asked why, she would just ruffle his shaggy hair and say, Can't let one of the world's future heroes go in without any training. Shota had been... Shota had taken to gymnastics like a duck to water. Shota had taken to gymnastics like a duck to water, as Inko had known he would. By the time he was six years old, he could do several flips in a role without any assistance. He went to competitions, and he always won. His walls and shelves were lined with trophies and medals, gold, silver, and bronze, covering the cracked plaster. Gymnastics was a good distraction for Shoda. The boy was always quite lonely. His dad was never there, always out spending the money that their mother worked so hard to bring home. His mother worked three jobs, and she came home late every night, only to leave early the next morning. Inko began to distance herself, always focused on school or her new boyfriend, Isashi Midoriya. If not for the money that was left in the cookie jar periodically for gymnastics and sweets, Shota couldn't be certain whether Inko came home at all. When he was seven years old, Inko graduated and stopped coming home. The money stopped appearing in the cookie jar and instead was mailed to them in plain white envelopes with no extra notes to explain herself. Her mother took on an extra job, and Shota almost never saw her, unless he stayed up in the wee hours of the night. His father stopped coming home. Life at school was miserable, all the children taunting him because his quirk hadn't come in yet. He was eight when it finally did come in. He'd been watching another villain fight, and it looked like the heroes were losing. His chest had ached, as he watched the underground hero be beaten into the ground. Something had tinged in the very tips of his fingers. And then his eyes had flashed red, and his long, shaggy black hair had risen from his shoulders, and the green fire that danced along the villain's skin had ceased abruptly. The hero lunged at the villain, and Shudda blinked, and his eyes became unbearably dry and achy. His irises, which had been a previous dark brown, were a bright red, but his quirk had activated. He ran home to tell Inko, and had been overwhelmingly disappointed 
and he remembered that he wouldn't find her there. The next day, not knowing what else to do, he told his teacher about his quirk, and how he made a villain's power stop working. The teacher had only given him a fearful glance, and had backed away. The other students had stared at him with distrustful eyes. The next day, a group of students had beaten him up. Shota was expelled. The other students weren't. His hair, which had been long and unruly and had fallen almost past the middle of his back, he cut short. It bunched up in the back, wild and unruly now that it wasn't so long and weighed down. Some patches were shorter than the others. He couldn't tie his hair back for gymnastics anymore, and the hair always fell in his eyes when he did flips. He had to pin his hair back with his sister's old hair clips, small and bright pink with cats on the end. Shota quite liked them, despite the fact that they were girly. Others didn't, but that was their problem, not Shota's. Though he couldn't understand why people could never be happy with him. He'd been bullied for his quirk coming in late, but when he got it, everyone was wary around him. They made fun of his hair for how long and unruly it was saying it made him look like a girl. But when he cut it short and pulled it back with clips, he still got made fun of. How was he supposed to make these people happy? It took a while to find a good school that would take someone like Shoda. Turns out a kid with an erasure quirk, who had fighting on his record, wasn't a good combination for many of the schools in Japan. He was eventually placed in a cheap public school. His mother was only able to afford one set of school uniform, so Shota had to go to school every day in shabby, wrinkled clothes. On the first day of school, his mother took a brush to his hair, which had grown shockingly quickly, just barely brushing the middle of his neck. She was in a hurry to brush it so he could get to school, and the brush's bristles pulled and ripped at his hair roughly. When he went to school, his scalp was unbearably achy, and his eyes were puffy. The school was crowded, filled with hundreds of other children. The school had a rule against children using their quirks, but you could often hear the crackle of explosions or the heat of flame dancing on fingertips. On the first day of school, in the hallway, a boy had extended his leg and had tripped him, but Shota didn't use his quirk. He didn't want to. When he got home that night, he went straight to bed. His mother woke him up hours later when she got home, and she had dragged him into the kitchen. She shaved all his shaggy hair off with a pair of clippers right down to the skull. She'd cut the skin right by his ear in her haze. Shota had hated the way the vibrating clippers had brushed over his still sore clout. Scalp. Fuck! Shota had hated the way the vibrating clippers... Killing myself. Shota had hated the way the vibrating clippers had brushed over his still sore scalp. The sensation had made him grind his teeth. At school the next day, a girl in his class called him Skinhead. The other children in his class had heard her and thought it was hilarious. By the end of the day, every child in the school called him Skinhead instead of his name. It made Shida wonder if they would have made fun of him if they saw the pink cat-themed hair clips. The days slowly faded into a gray haze, one after another. School was a dull spot in his life, a dark smear on his bright, enthusiasm to become a hero, like a pencil mark on a plain white paper. He hardly remembered school anymore, though he still made the highest mark in his grade. His life revolved around gymnastics and watching the heroes from rooftops, wondering if someday, maybe, just maybe, that could be him. Once a month, his mother would wake him up in the middle of the night to shave his head down to the scalp. The clippers, always opening up that same, almost healed over scab behind his ear. He always walked to school with his ear feeling tender, hot, and irritated. She shaved his head on his birthday, same haircut as always, right down to the skull. When he woke up, she was gone, no festivities. His sister didn't come to visit, and his father, like always, was nowhere to be seen. His present was a bloodied ear, and a lollipop from the librarian, when she looked at his profile when he was turning in his books and had seen it was his birthday. Just before he turned ten, he sent his sister a letter, saying that he missed her. 
that he wished she would visit, even though he understood why she couldn't, since the return address stated she lived on the other side of Japan, informed her that it was almost his birthday, and that he couldn't believe he was almost ten. Said he was thinking about mowing lawns so he could save up for self-defense classes, along with gymnastics, to prepare him for a life as a hero. Said that he loved her, and that he, once again, hoped to see her soon. He got the response on the day of his birthday, 300 extra dollars for his defense classes, and a single piece of white printer paper. On the paper, typed in bold letters, were the words, Happy Birthday, Shoda. He took a mixed martial arts class. He got his ass handed to him to the boys much older than him, again and again, until he finally got the hang of it. He had been on the brink of quitting many times. When the world got too loud, when the lights were too bright, when the shadows bruised that were left by the unwielding fist of those bigger and stronger stung just a little too much. But he couldn't, because he would be a hero. Because he was a hero. His instructor informed him that he was a master of gymnastics, better than her, and that he should consider taking parkour classes. Shoulda had no ties to the place, no nostalgia for it, no friends. So he did. And just like with gymnastics, he took to it like a pro. When he was 12 years old, his haircuts became fewer and farther in between, as his mother became more and more tired. She cut them every two months now, sometimes longer. The hair was always past his ears when she did, sticking up and messy and shaggy. He never combed it because the bristles hurt. When his mother was around to give him his midnight haircuts, the scab behind his ear was almost always completely healed over, but it would always split open under her mistractions. Sometimes his mother forgot to buy groceries, and all Shoda ate were sweets with the spare money Inko sent periodically. That was okay with Shoda, since the food he cooked with the groceries was never that good anyways. Though, so much chocolate did make his stomach twist painfully on occasion. But Shoda could never seem to find the words to ask for more groceries during their midnight haircuts, because his mother was always so tired and so irritated. So he made do with what he had. When he was 14, and he finally told his instructor why he was taking mixed martial art classes, he told him to sign up for UA, the greatest hero school in Japan. So Shoda did. It was difficult. All the other students had such flashy quirks. Ice and sleeping gas and earth and metal and some loud kid that made his head hurt. Why couldn't he just shut up? He was younger than the rest, since he was born during the school year, and shorter and weaker and less powerful. But that was okay, because what Shoda lacked in strength, he made up for in determination. Determination, it turned out, wasn't everything. I'm sorry, Mr. Aizawa. The odd-looking rat creature said. Shota couldn't quite respond, so busy trying to figure out what exactly this person, thing, animal was. I understand you were trying for the hero course, but, of course, you couldn't have gotten in with a quirk such as yours. Shota nodded. He was disappointed, extremely so, but there were other schools, and there were other ways to get hero licenses. He wasn't out of option. However, Nezu said, cutting off his train of thoughts, you showed great promise. Despite not having a flashy quirk, you did well. I have a proposition for you. Should have blinked, nodded. We can't put you into the hero course but we do have room in the general studies program. Should have frowned, cleared his throat. Sir, he said, trying to keep his voice from breaking. It was always gravelly now that he was older. And when it wasn't gravelly, it was squeaky. Should have hoped it would find a nice medium someday, because it was truly aggravating to hear. I appreciate it, but I want to be in the hero course to be a hero. Let me finish, Aizawa, Nezu said, smiling sweetly, though Shoda knew that it hid sharp teeth. 
In the middle of the school here, UA holds an annual sports festival. Many Hero Corps students compete for a chance at getting a good internship with a Hero Agency. And many students in other divisions compete for a chance to being transferred into the Hero Corps. It's rare that we do, but if you truly impress me like you did in the exam, I might consider it. This was the chance of a lifetime. He knew. But was it worth it? Was it worth the precious months he would waste in the general studies program? when there was only a chance he would be transferred into the hero corps? He ran a hand through his hair. It was beginning to grow since the last haircut, though his scalp was still prickly. He missed his long hair. Even if he knew to get back to his long hair, he'd have to go back to pinning it up with clips. He could do this, right? He nodded to himself, determined. His hands gripped the fabric of his black slacks. He looked up. Eyes narrowed. Determination hadn't been enough to get him through the entrance exam, but it could be enough to get him through the sports festival. I won't let you down, sir. After he started going to UA, his mother stopped coming home so much. Groceries were delivered to the apartment every so often, but his mother was never with them. He still got the money from his sister and showed a doubt that she knew that his mother had stopped returning. Before he woke up in the morning, there was always a dirty cup in the sink, smell of tea, of hot chocolate, or coffee, or whatever else had struck her fancy. These days, the only cups he found in the sink were his own. But that was okay. He could adapt. His hair grew longer, ridiculously quickly. Now that his mother wasn't shaping it all away, by the time he was two months in UA, he had to clip his hair back again. He didn't have the time nor the energy to go to the store to buy new clips, so he used the same old pink cat clips. He worked harder in parkour and mixed arts, his muscles always strained from overuse. He got taller, eventually, but with all the chocolates he always ate instead of proper food, it wasn't all that surprising that he wasn't very tall yet. When he was four months into UA, just a few weeks before the sports festival, he got another letter from his sister, the usual amount of money, fell out of the envelope. Along with the money was a card, an invitation, standard with no touch of personality, more than likely bought at a dollar store. It was a letter to a wedding, more specifically, Isashi Midoriya and Inko Aizawa's wedding. The card was pink, just like the ever-present cat clips, and showed his hair. The address was far away, and he wasn't sure how he would manage to get there, but he stuck it on the fridge with a magnet. Excitement, and something like apprehension, thrummed through his veins. How long had it been? Seven years since he'd last seen her in person? He'd have to get a suit, find some way to control his hair, get a gift. His teachers liked him well enough. If he missed a single payment, then they wouldn't be too terribly upset. He'll just have to pay them back, somehow. Perhaps cleaning their establishments after practice, or on the weekends to make up for it. Yes, that he would do. The wedding was two days before the sports festival. Should have bought a nice suit, call a gray with a blood red button up and a black tie. He couldn't afford dress shoes along with the suit and the gifts, along with the transport, so he just wore the nicest pair of sneakers. He took gel to his hair and tried his best to comb it back. The stray hairs that escaped the gel's hold he pinned back with the pink cat clips. He bought Inko a necklace with a moon charm on it. For Asashi, who he couldn't remember much about, besides the fact that he wasn't his biggest fan, he bought a simple watch, leather strap, soft on the skin. He took a bus to the wedding and hoped the seats wouldn't damage his suit. The buses always seemed too loud and dirty. After that bus, he took another bus and then a train. The wedding was in a garden. It was only just starting when he arrived. He kept his present on his person rather than setting it on the table designed for presents and sat back at the wedding. The bride and groom wore konomos, black and white. His sister looked different than he remembered. Green hair pulled back into a bun, face powered and lips painted red. There was a flower in her hair. She looked older, more sophisticated. Not like the teenage girl 
who stayed up with him on rooftops to study the heroes fighting below. The ceremony continued, as could be expected. After the ceremony came the reception. The adults drank, sake, danced, and chatted. It was hard to find Inka over the dozens of bustling people, but the flashing lights and the loud noises showed his skin prickled every time someone got too close. Eventually, Inko sat down, and her new husband went around to talk to business associates. She leaned her head back against her seat and let her eyes fall close. Long black lashes displayed on powdered cheeks. Should have thought she looked odd, not human. He sat at her table, just looked at her. She didn't notice him for a while until she looked up, eyes widened, Shoda nodded in her direction. Shoda, she asked, voice breathy and bordering on disbelief. Hey, he said, not knowing quite how to respond. You're here, she noted. Is, is mom? No, Shoda said. Just me. I haven't seen her in a while. Her cups are never in the sink anymore. And dad? Still gone. When was the last time mom was there? Four months? Five months? I don't know. When I started high school, she stopped coming home at night and stopped giving me my haircuts. Ah. Ingo said. So, you're alone? Should have blinked at her. No, yes. At home. I have my instructors. And I'm thinking about getting a cat, so I won't be alone then. I'm okay. Ingo smiled at him in a way that she had smiled at him before. So many years ago. Chapters ago. Lifetimes ago. Or, that's what it felt like. It made something and showed his stomach twist and ache, like it did when he ate too much candy, or when he was sad, or scared. He couldn't tell whether she was smiling at him because she felt she had to, or because she was really, truly happy to see him. You got old. Shoda noted. Ingo laughed. I suppose I did. So did you. You're taller now. Time tends to do that to a person. Shoda noted. It's funny, like that. Are you 25? Unfortunately, Inko said with a hint of bitterness. I wish I was 25. I'd be a hero by now and have lots of cats. I suppose you would, Inko said. Still suck on being a hero? Yes, Shoda said. I'm going to UA now. I'm in general studies, but I'm going to transfer to the hero course. I think my quirk would be useful for taking down villains. Inko smiled fondly. I'm sure it will be, Shoda, she said. How can you be sure? Shoda asked, tilting his head to the side. You don't know what it is. I don't. Because you left. Because I left. It's erasure, Shoda said. I can erase people's quirks. No one likes me because of that. But I don't really like anyone else, either. That's okay, Shoda, Inko said. If they don't like you because of your quirk, they don't deserve you. You left before I got my quirk, Shoda said. So why don't you like me? Why didn't Dad like me? I don't know why Dad didn't like us, Inko admitted. That's just how life played out. But I do like you, Shoda, I love you. But you left me. But I left you. Will you come back? Shoda asked. Shoda wasn't sure why he did. He already knew what the answer would be. What would she say? Maybe it was wishful thinking. Or maybe he was just tired of being alone. I know you don't like cats. Unless they're on hair clips. He pointed at the hair clip in his hair. If you come back, I won't get a cat. I can't come back. Inko said. And you can't come with me. I'm sorry, Shoda. Shoda hummed. No, you're not. But that's okay. Can you give me a reason why you can't? No. 
No, I don't think I can. Should have nodded. Have a happy marriage, Inca. He handed her the box with the necklace and the watch. The moon is for you. He stood up. Do you have any suggestions to name my cat? Inko dabbed a napkin at her eyes. Takara, she said. It matches with the owner. Shoda nodded. You said you loved me. I do. I love you too. And I hope to see you again. Even though I won't. Can you just... Can you just call? Please? Or, or write a letter with the money... Or something. I'm sorry. Should have blinked hard. Why did you invite me today? Because you're family. Did you want to see me? I want to see you every day, Shoda. Inko sighed. Then why can't you? Sometimes things don't make sense. You'll understand someday. I promise you. I don't think I will. That's okay. Stop saying that, just... He sighed. Goodbye, Inko. Goodbye, Shoda. That is a good place to leave off for today. So, chapter one is still not finished. I am not done with chapter one. There is still more of chapter one. I'm just breaking it up into multiple parts. Hope you understand. This fanfic is going to be broken up into multiple parts. This is going to be one where the episodes and the chapters do not align. As in next time, we're going to be on episode 2, chapter 1. So, tune in for that. I want to talk about Shoda for a second. Because Shoda has, um, Shoda's autistic in this one. Shoda, 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 Shoda's one of us. One of me. Shoda. You and me. I, I feel you. Uh, especially the loud places and socializing. Ooh! We, yep, that's that sucks. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of his sensory issues, which seems to stem with the whole brushes, the vibrations of the razor, or not the razor, what are those called? Razors, what are the fuck they're called? Um, and then, um, huh, there was a third one, I forgot the third one noises, noises. He really hated loud people around him. And if you guys noted that, that UA. Uh, entrance exam he noted some of his friends the ones that I caught on to was obviously the, the big one Yamada duh and then obviously this is an eraser mic one so I'd like to say that they, they do get together um, and then Namuri was there with the sleeping gas so that was interesting but um, loud people yeah or loud places and crowded places yeah that sucks I hate being in a public crowded place it sucks as for uh, brushes, I have never um, had that sensory issue, but um, if you have, you can relate with Shoda for a bit. I can relate to him in the sense of um, horse hair. I fucking hate horse hair. Okay, look, I've touched a horse before when I was little and it was fine, right? But now, like, you know horse hair that's like on, like, let's say you buy a wallet and the wallet is horse hair. Like it has horse hair all around. Oh, just thinking about that, I wanna chop my hands off right now. Fuck, okay. Ah, God, fuck. Okay, I'm gonna have that weird sensation on my hand for the rest of the day. Great, amazing, wonderful. Oh, fuck. Okay, sorry, sorry. Shit, fuck, okay. <laughs> this is how I get, this is how I get. I, I sympathize with Shoto because like, this is how I feel just thinking about touching it. Like, I can't even imagine, like, like I, fuck. Okay, no, mm -mm. okay, yeah. No, but like, I understand his pain with sensory issues. It is fucking sucky and, and bitchy. And it's it's even suckier in a social um, inflammation. Specifically, when I tell people that I really, really like, uh, for example, I have a person in my life who owns a wallet like that. And when they ask me to pass their wallet, they always look at me weirdly because I'm holding it at like an angle, like at the very tip where none of the hair is and I'm holding it like far away from my body as if it's a murder scene or a, a weapon or something. And I just have people staring at me like, why are you doing that? I'm like, I can't touch it. If I touch it, I will, I will want to vomit. If I touch it, I will want to off myself. If I touch it, I'm unsubscribing from life. Um, and people always look at me weirdly because it's like, 
You're over-exaggerating. No, I'm not. I feel like that. So I feel Shota in a sense because um, you can't outright say to people like, for example, he doesn't only have the implementation of obviously not being taken serious, but also the implementation of his mother is tired. He barely sees his mother. He doesn't feel like he can confide to his mother about these things. So he lets his mother, uh, what's it called? Uh, raise his, raise his head, uh, shave his head. And um, the vibrations, I don't have that sensory issue, but my little brother really, really fucking hates it. We, mm, we struggle to get him a haircut. Like, absolutely struggle. Like, we try not to use it as much because if it's not necessary, we won't use it. If it's necessary, we use it. He gives us a little signal that, all right, that's enough, that's enough. We stop, we give him a break, we use it again, right? Um, we, we work with him and stuff like that. So I understand Shota in those sensory issues. And I actually really, really, really love how they portray Shota here with um, with his autism, uh, especially that conversation with Inko. I know that there's some underlining things with Inko and this whole fanfic, I don't know what to feel on Inko. I'm not gonna spoiler or anything like that. I just, I have mixed feelings about Inko and I still do even after reading all that I've read. So yeah, how are we thinking so far? What do we think about Shota's backstory, his family life, how it is? Um, everything. I just want to know your opinions and stay tuned for the rest of the chapter tomorrow. At least I hope it's the rest of the chapter. I mean, I'm halfway through the chapter. I can, I can do the rest of the chapter. Yeah. So what are we thinking about tomorrow? Or what do we think about this video today? Like, what do you think so far of this chapter? And can't wait to see you tomorrow. As always, my raindrops, make sure to eat, sleep, drink water, take your meds. Have a wonderful day or night. Link to my Discord server and socials are down in the description. Subscribe to see more of my content and thank you so much for watching.